didn't start with wanting to write a book. What we wanted to do was to put together practical advice and information about how to decide what interventions, medications, technologies should be subsidized by public monies and which not, and how different countries went about doing that. This is really an emerging field. There's been a lot written in related fields on cost-effectiveness analysis, on health technology assessment, on generic priority setting, but less on how to very practically make it work in a given government setting, especially in low-income countries, because there you would guess that the stakes are higher, your budget is smaller, so deciding what's in and what's out is even more important. So I start out with a very simple one. Um, the process of setting up and adjusting your health benefits package is practical. I don't know how about you, but I have been in so many countries where there are tremendously ambitious views of how uh, the benefits package is actually going to be designed and adjusted. And they, these ambitions are just not in line with the av available resources. You have to think about how to make your design and adjustment coherent with your time. Political time is very often very different from technical time. I think you have all heard of politicians saying that they want the total benefits package designed with an overall HTA review for all the potential services in one year. So you have to be coherent with your time, with your money, with the political restrictions, your info, and your skills. Second, we should never forget that the sustainability of a health benefits package policy rests on support from key stakeholders because they are the ones who are going to give you the money to implement the benefits package policy. And that's just as important. They are the ones who are going to support you when you have to take very difficult decisions about what's out. So what this means in terms of good governance is that you should take into account stakeholders. They will want to have a voice. They will want to know what you do, how you do it, why you do it. They need to trust in what you're doing. So technically robust work is very important. And also trust is not something that just appears like that. It builds up over time, which leads me to another important good governance principle you need to apply processes consistently over time to let trust build up. Uh, the third characteristic of a sustainable health benefits package policy is, of course, that it must be affordable and implementable. And I think there have been many great comments this morning showing that very often health benefits packages are neither affordable nor implementable very often they are aspirational, but without saying so. Because I think it's okay if you say that your idea of the future is that and that benefits package and that you want to move towards that, that goal, but you have to say how you're gonna get there. And you have to start establishing the process of how you're gonna gradually move into that direction. Because otherwise, for politicians, it's very easy and very rewarding to say that they are going to provide a very comprehensive benefits package. And they will leave in two years, and they don't care about uh, at all whether it's affordable or implementable. So uh, the good governance principle that is implied here is that you have to be coherent with your resources and with other public policies. Fourth, and I find that interesting that this morning several of you were saying, we are in the process of reviewing our benefits package. I find that very interesting because 10 years ago, most people would say, we are about to think how to design our benefits package. Now it's more about revision, but what I also find interesting is that when people talk about reviewing their benefits package, very often they do it as if they were starting it all over again. 
So this means to me that no processes have been in place. Last but not least, I think, and you will say that it is self-evident, but your benefits package needs to be in line with your goals. I think we, many of us know uh, normative frameworks which, which state great goals of a benefits package benefiting, benefiting the population, health and financial protection, and da, da, da. But then when you look at the benefits package, it's not really connected. And even worse, when you look at what's gradually being included in these benefits packages, goals seem to be forgotten. So um, what's, the, what's the message here for good governance? Make sure goals are a key element when deciding on what to prioritize now and in the future. Resist political pressure to include services for political reasons and make sure resources get allocated to the benefits included in your package. That last point, I think we have been talking about that this morning and Amanda will have a whole session that will talk about this. So getting to this sustainable health benefits package um, is a very difficult issue, especially given two characteristics. First, a health benefits package is something most people really care about. It's not just constructing a highway or getting a new sewage plant or um, getting an education program for PhD students. It's something everybody cares about. So what this means is that people will really be watching what you're doing, which also means that good governance is absolutely essential. And that the other characteristic of context is that it's not a rewarding political business to define a benefits package. So it's difficult to reach the goals of a sustainable health benefits package policy and the context of scrutiny and of political costs involved in it makes it especially difficult endeavor. Uh, some key concerns, um, I think some of them have been mentioned um, this morning, conflicts of interest, especially of strong groups, pharmaceutical industry, uh, insurance companies. Um, so you have to, to think about how to manage them explicitly. They won't just go away. This is a very difficult issue. A second issue is this uh, imbalance of power, which is really difficult to manage. Uh, someone this morning said, I wished we had more help with the management of key stakeholders. I absolutely agree. This is a very difficult issue. To never use participation just because it's politically correct to do so, it costs you a lot of money and it can be counterproductive. Try to institutionalize participation and uh, never forget that it is very resource intensive. So you better think where you're going to focus your effort to have people participate. And once more, an example from Colombia, now that the benefits package is dead, they now are designing a negative list, which is extremely limited. Um, it can only include cosmetic surgery, surgery abroad, um, and um, medications that are still being experimented, so it's, it's tiny. Uh, consistency and coherence, this is something uh, I think we have been talking very much about the whole morning, and I think it's a very important good governance principle. And um, I will just mention some of the key aspects of a con consistently and coherently applied um, uh, benefits package policy. Um, first, you need to be consistent with the cr criteria and processes to update the benefits package. At the very beginning, I've been talking about this. Uh, once again, you're more than invited to look at examples I put up there later. It's more often the case that these processes are not in place and that every time there is a new adjustment, there are new ad hoc and erratic ways of doing so. Um, there are some countries which have um, stipulation in their normative framework mandating a regular update of the benefits package. Just one cautionary note on 
risks and costs of good governance. It's clearly resource intensive. It needs money, time, personnel, and there are some examples in the book there which tell you that this is not a cheap business. It can backfire. It can produce unexpected, undesired, and even opposite results, especially if only those with strong voices get to, to uh, get themselves heard. Um, it can lead, transparency, for example, can lead to a blaming culture and just uh, block processes. It can be just a formality. And it's clearly, it doesn't help um, to a smoother health benefit design and adjustments process. But I think it does help to make your health benefits package policy more sustainable. Thank you. Uh, talking about the role of the HTA in health benefit package development for the universal healthcare coverage in Thailand. Uh, first of all, I would like to recommend that before you develop any uh, process in your country, you have to understand context and constraints. Uh, for Thailand, as we know that there are the three main schemes of the health insurance in Thailand. Uh, the oldest one is the civil silver medical care scheme, which they represent as a welfare for the government officer. Uh, in Thailand, we just only have uh, 1.7 million of the government officer and another three millions of their dependents in Thailand. This fringe benefit are very interested uh, for the providers because they pay with a uh, open end. Uh, you can see that they pay with a fee for service for our patient and pay with a DRG for inpatient and still reimburse for any non-essential medicine if you can prescribe and, and can inform any specific criteria or uh, recommendation that you have to use it. Uh, for another two scheme, uh, the social security scheme is a recover people that were in the formal sector. Right now, there are around uh, 12 million, uh, which cover around the 18 percent. Uh, this one is only have a contribution from a tri-party, from the government, from the employee and employers, uh, and the rest reducted for the total population are the member of the UC scheme. Uh, just only uh, CSMBS and UC scheme that are tax funded. 100% from the government. But the payment system for these two schemes is a very similar. We pay with a capitation for our patient and pay with a DRG for inpatient. This is the, what we call the closed end system. It's not so interested for the provider because it's a closed end system. So that's why we have to separate some fund. Uh, we call the central reimbursement in order to make more compensation for our provider. We reimburse uh, the provider with, uh, in medicines uh, for some high costly medicine and pay in cash on top uh, for uh, some hos hospital that can comply with the, uh, our standard cancer protocol and also have uh, established some fee schedule for some special disease management. So we know our constraint. So we try to compensate for the provider in order to improve the access to uh, health service for our beneficiaries. Uh, the problem is this, because the benefit package for the UC come from so many ways, come from the professional or the academic suggestion, come from the complaints from the, uh, our beneficiary, and and, and necessary is that uh, we conduct the public hearing every year. So the public hearing have uh, gathered a lot of the requirements from so many areas in, in Thailand. And then in the past, uh, that I mentioned that we have a subcommittee to develop for the uh, health benefit here. And they just only to approve to the subcommittee if we have in money enough or not. If, if the uh, subcommittee said uh, on the health finance said that, okay, it's affordable. And then they will submit to the uh, National Health Security Board to make a decision that we will reject or we will agree. The problem has come because there are a lot of the number of the issue proposed from so a variety of the group of the stakeholder that come into the subcommittee every year. Some have a very, uh, very con quality of the evidence, but some are very weak, uh, especially uh, that based on the expert opinion on some case. So 
we found that uh, it was evident that there was a bias sometimes uh, to the power groups. If they can uh, inform to the newspaper and make uh, into social media and have a lot of pressure on the subcommittee. So this is uh, what we have uh, faced in, in the past. And sometimes they can lobby to our secretary as well. Uh, so now we try to replace this process with uh, some technical body with a systematic, transparent, tra part a participatory, and evidence-based. Uh, something that what we call technical body is a tough job for an HSO because how can we make it more accountability, transparency, and responsibility? What the HTA provide for UC development? They try to provide the value of, uh, for our money uh, by using the threshold of the ICER, uh, and the budget impact compare the current practice and the new intervention, and then talking about the feasibility study because we have to concern more for the capacity of the, prof uh, of the providers too. But be careful that HTA or HITAP is just uh, no mandate to make any policy decision. They just inform the policy development. So I just want to give you a bit of background uh, to the situation that uh, is going on in South Africa. I think uh, everybody here knows we've got 54 million people, a very high Gini coefficient. So this issue of inequalities is front and center in South Africa and cannot be ignored and it actually bears no relationship to the GDP. So it's a very unusual situation. Uh, life expectancy at birth is rising, but minimally. HIV prevalence is still very high. We're at the epicenter of the HIV epidemic and um, we don't have um, the same kind of physician uh, ratio as most um, countries, certainly in high-income countries. So the healthcare provision in South Africa is the following. Um, you can see that um, there are about 16%, the top there uh, is privately insured patients with minimum benefits legislation and about 80 medical schemes. Um, there's privately self-funding patients who um, purchase out of pocket from pri private and public facilities and public sector patients which are sometimes overlap with their privately self-funding patients depending on what people can do. Uh, and in this case, uh, fairly weak infrastructure and fragmented and is subjected to existing national policies and provincial programs. There's variable quality, but it is free currently at the point of use. So I think it's very important. The access uh, is also pretty uh, available, uh, but as I said, variable quality and the main difficulty with access actually is transport. So um, it's not really about, and it's also waiting times to get into the clinic, but in fact, everybody has access in the country and it's free. Um, so uh, the, the public sector is tax funded, the private sector is households and individual funded, um, and um, the spend per annum you can see uh, is about tenfold different between the private and the public sector. So the national health insurance has been on the cards since uh, South Africa uh, became a democratic uh, state. And um, there's a white paper that was issued in 2015. Um, I'm looking at it mainly from the point of view of HTA, which talks about a little bit about what HTA could do uh, in the process of national health insurance. Um, but I do want to just say this, that achieving sustainable and equitable NHI slash UHC in South Africa will certainly identify rely on the following four issues. Firstly, identifying the benefit packages that are cost effective, that's important, but that would improve equity. And I just want to say there's been a big, um, I don't know how else to characterize it, uh, disaster in the last couple of months with a whole lot of mentally ill patients being transferred to NGOs in, in around the country. And over a hundred and probably more of those people have died. And people are, the public is completely outraged, which, and so are we actually, uh, as to what has happened. But I do want to just say that if you want to talk about political economy, this is an issue that will affect the way we talk about money, costs, and value for money. 
in health because people are just furious that the cost of sending these people to NGOs and where they died of diarrhea and dehydration, literally, um, is going to be a hard sell. Anyhow, the bottom line is, as I've showed you before, because of the Gini coefficient, the issues around equity and the most vulnerable are really front and centre here. Um, the other thing is that understanding the impact of quality improvement on health budgets is, is going to be critical. Okay? We have access. 90% of South Africa uh, mothers actually deliver in a health facility. And um, so we don't, we're not at a point where we need to increase that. But what we do need is a quality improvement issue. Okay? And that has been flagged by policymakers as critical. Certainly targeting the most at-risk populations is important and improving data collection on patient outcomes with better financing indicators and enhanced processes of care will be critical, and the data collection issues certainly can be improved. So this is, uh, this is where we are, and I just thought it would be helpful to set the tone. Um, we've done a legal and policy gap analysis um, in July 2016. There is no specific provision in the National Health Act for an HTA entity or agency. It's fairly narrowly and incompletely defined. Um, and the limit, there's been limited attention given in the NHI white paper regarding the mechanisms and structures. There's certainly now been a lot of opportunity to comment, uh, and we've certainly uh, done that. Um, we work closely actually with CGD uh, on this work uh, as to whether we need an independent priority setting institution immediately. And we are now working on uh, who and how the key functions will be performed, what the current capacity is, and what sort of capacity strengthening is required. Uh, and as a result of our efforts uh, with the National Department of Health uh, and the Treasury, uh, we've, we've been asked to assist with this from Priceless. So, um, we'll certainly draw on the mapping reports that we've done um, and how it interacts with other public bodies, what the human resource requirements are and logistical arrangements, and we're in the process of uh, developing a phased strategic plan or roadmap for the development of an HTA function. Um, so, as I said, there's, there's no established national HTA organisation yet. We're in the process of doing this. Uh, it will include, we hope, uh, efforts to create clinical practice guidelines and protocols, the pricing of healthcare products, and the reimbursement and package of benefits. Um, and and we, sh we should recognize that this will be advisory in nature. Um, I don't want to go uh, through all of this, but we certainly want to meet the constitutional requirement for reasonableness, uh, where the Constitution has said the state must take reasonable legislative and other me measures within its available resources to achieve progressive realization for all South Africans of the right to access of healthcare services. And we think that an HTA framework can provide this uh, accountability for reasonable wellness. Section, uh, section 27 of the Constitution states that every person has the right to have access to healthcare services, including reproductive health care. And in South Africa, we have excellent health policies, um, but obviously we cannot fund every single policy that has been issued by government. And Treasury plays an important role in determining where to allocate resources based on the national priorities set by government um, and through civic engagement. And uh, to give you an idea of um, some of the background in terms of the national health insurance process. Um, I can start from 2011 when the process was kick-started and government um, issued a green paper. And the process has been um, jointly um, done in collaboration with National Department of Health and National Treasury um, in terms of drafting the green paper. and. Also, the NHI work streams, I don't know if um, all of you are familiar with the NHI work streams process in South Africa, but in 2014, um, a workshop was held in which Treasury and National Department of Health and provincial um, government representatives met to discuss the way forward on NHI. And the outcome of the workshop 
was determining what are the key contentious issues um, between Treasury and NDOH around the NHI proposals laid out in the Green Paper. Um, and one of the, the work streams that was created, um, so there were six work streams that were created um, out, out of these con list of contentious issues that were identified in the, work in the workshop. And one of the work streams is designing an NHI benefit package. Um, which a few of us are, are members of in um, the room today. And from that, um, we've been working um, very closely with the Department of Health. And as Karen mentioned, uh, the white paper was released in late 2015. And uh, the work streams process has been um, contained to the select numbers in, in the designated work streams. And what um, we still need to improve on is civic engagement and um, interacting with um, the public and provinces and also private um, players, uh, which we hope to um, going forward. There are numerous policies um, that we need to fund as government, but with constrained resources and um, tight budgets, uh, Treasury and the Department of Health need to make these difficult decisions on where to allocate resources. And one of the areas that uh, the Department of Health and, and Treasury have made a strong commitment towards is HIV and AIDS services. And in 2003, the government created an HIV conditional grant, and it's the only conditional grant in um, the health sector specifically for one disease area. And from 2003 to, um, to now, it's, it's grown. It, it's an extremely strong program, very well funded and very well run at the provincial level um, with strong political backing. And um, we're at a stage where we need to think about whether we want to make this conditional grant stronger, or do we need to look more holistically at primary health care delivery, because HIV is primarily delivered at the PHC level. Um, and, and it's currently about 20 billion rands per year um, at the HIV conditional grant. And the total budget is roughly 160 billion. So it's a, a, a fairly large portion for one specific disease area. And every budget cycle, we add an additional billion rand to, um, to um, expand the ARV program, to bring new initiates onto the ARV program. And we are at a crossroads now determining, do we want to continue these annual investments in the outer year um, for HIV when a, uh, TB is the number one killer in South Africa and we have a growing NCD burden. And if we're just looking at uh, NCDs, the number, the, the proportion of deaths related to NCDs is about 55%. And honing in on diabetes. Diabetes is the number one killer among women in South Africa and in Western Cape, my colleague from Western Cape will be speaking just now. Um, it's the number one killer in, in Western Cape. Um, so we have to really think about how are we investing our, our resources for health? Are we going on the right path by strengthening a, a already strong HIV program? Or do we need to shift our perspective and look at strengthening the, the health system more holistically? Uh, we've uh, already said if the costs are available are more than the available budget, the priorities won't convey to providers or to the delivery of services. Um, and how does that fail very frequently because there's no process to adjust for changing costs or inflation? or there's no process to adjust the capitation for inclusions. Uh, because grandfathering, what I mean by grandfathering is a lot of times when we start a benefits plan policy, we look at our expenditure in the last year 
and we just divide that by the number of people and we say this is the amount it costs to provide a bunch of services because you just have to move on quickly. That's called grandfathering and it's been used in a lot of different countries. Um, and that's fine at first, right? But after, you know, it becomes out of date, it becomes very problematic very quickly because costs, generally speaking, exceed the set of services that, that you have in place. And another issue is around adjusting for economic cycle. We're all subject to booms and busts. Commodity costs, a lot of countries' economies are really tied to the price of certain commodities. Are you set up to respond to that in the way you're budgeting for benefits? And then frequently, you know, we see a situation where there's no budget impact analysis at all. And, and this is something that I think you're pointing out to us when you say there's lots of investment cases and cost effectiveness studies, I think it was Patrick who said it, suggesting lots of different things are cost effective. But the point is, well, either you're going to use a rule for cost effective that actually re reflects the budget constraint, which or you should do a budget impact analysis, which allows you to know what it actually means to fund it. And Net showed us this morning the budget impact analysis of different options with different levels of efficacy. Okay, so how could we worry a little less? So one thing to think about, and, and this is in a way kind of a generic comment about health policy, but it's it's... I, I'm tying it back to the issue of the benefits plan, is there are macro strategies that you can anticipate you'll need to be able to fit budget to plan over time because things will change over time too. So, um, you know, I just, and these are just examples. The chapter includes more examples and you'll have your own examples. So one um, is adopting cost sharing for lower priority services. Now this is extraordinarily controversial that I would say this, obviously. Uh, you know, no one likes user fees, no one wants a barrier at services, but if something is lower priority and you can subsidize something of higher priority, we should be able to make the case that that is pro-equity, pro-health, and not take an across-the-board view of this. I'll leave it to you to fight it out. Okay. Another, you know, because the alternative is implicit rationing. That is the thing that is hard to convey to the advocacy community, but it's really, really important. Um, also, well, something like uh, value-based pricing or um, they have these like risk-sharing purchasing agreements with pharma that I don't know how well they've been evaluated, but, you know, one, this is more like a medicines policy thing, but the idea of using, um, they'll allow, they'll, they'll let people buy whatever they want, but they will only reimburse for the cost-effective generic option that's on the market, you know, so they're those kinds of things. Um, a second kind of category of strategy be, would be around, you know, smoothing cyclical effects or an, anticipating unexpected expenditures. So, you know, if you're a health insurance fund, you've already done this, but you should have a reserve that disperses automatically to cover your benefit liability when contributions fall. How far that goes is also, but, you know, like if Estonia has like six months in their reserve fund to survive, what happens at six months if they're contributions don't go back up, well, they're going to have to revisit the benefits plan again. I, I put adjusting benefits at the bottom because this is what this whole session is about, and we'll talk about this a lot tomorrow. But, you know, ideally you would adjust benefits last, right? You would try and do these other things to, if, if you've gotten to a list of benefits that you think is cost-effective and important and meets all your needs and all that kind of thing. Um, analytic methods can contribute in the following ways. They act as a sort of um, referee above the fight between different interest groups. And so they can act as a, a consistent referee between competing, competing claims for resources. Um, the whole um, issue, when, when you start doing analytic methods, one of the things I like about uh, any model is that it, you begin to realize what the key issues are and actually um, what what you need information from the policymakers about, what values you need from them. But actually, when you try and pin them down as to what they mean by fair, it's actually quite, quite difficult to get them to say whether, for example, is it equal access for equal need? Is it equal life opportunities? Is it just equal uh, resources? Um, and actually, they're often quite resistant to that. But as analysts, if we, if we are asked to incorporate equity into our work, 
we have to know what concept of equity we're being expected. Certainly, analytic methods do facilitate the sorts of things Ursula was talking about yesterday, facilitating accountability, transparency, and consistency. Um, and also, we have very little evidence on much of what we do, uh, but the analytic methods, the role of them is to use that evidence to best effect and to squeeze the most information we can out of it. And actually, I think um, some of the work that uh, health economists do, particularly on the benefit side, modeling future benefits, is absolutely miraculous. Well, some people might say it's foolhardy, but I think it's miraculous the way that they can model future health uh, as a result of an intervention using uh, epidemiological models or uh, uh, other methods. And I, I think that's a terrific thing. Uh, and that these courses that we talk about um, on cost-effectiveness analysis uh, obviously give uh, a very good grounding in those sorts of methods. Resources are limited for analysis. And so using analytic methods, we can actually focus on which areas of analysis um, it's really worth trying to uh, sort out. They, they can find out where um, we really need to know uh, what the best course of action is. And the other thing about uh, analysis um, is that the, uh, it can act as a way of demonstrating that health service resources are being spent wisely. Actually, I think it's really important, particularly, for example, in the negotiations between a health ministry and a finance ministry, um, that the, the finance ministry can be assured that the resources are being directed where they have best value. And it's the analytic methods that can, in principle, help with that, uh, with that task. So, uh, what are the key analytic choices we make, we have to make when making our methods operational? First thing is to work out what we mean by value. Well, health is the traditional one, and um, recently uh, we're getting much better at recognizing what we mean by financial protection. Um, I'm actually not sure we've quite got the metrics right on financial protection. Um, financial protection has two elements. One is that it's whether people are paying a lot of money for their health care, and that's the thing the World Bankers concentrate on. But the other element is whether people actually get access to services or whether they're deterred from services because they can't afford it. They're certainly not having any financial impact, but they're not getting the health they, they need. So financial protection, I don't think we've quite got to the bottom of the metrics for that yet. It's actually based on a simple concept of constrained maximization, uh, typically of health with respect to, uh, to a, budget, a fixed budget. Um, and what we try to do for every... Um, every intervention we consider, we want to see what the incremental costs and benefits arising from inclusion of that intervention would be. This incremental thing is really important, and, and sadly, I think we've had a bit of a diversion from WHO. They haven't... I mean, WHO do a lot of great work, in, uh, but sometimes I think they... Um, they go off the rails a bit, and generalised cost-effectiveness analysis, or WHO choice, which actually said so we will look at um, we will look at interventions from a zero base. Now, one of the big weaknesses I think of cost-effectiveness and CEA is that uh, it does assume, in its simplest form, that interventions are independent of each other. Costs. Yeah, so I said I'd talk a bit about costs today, and this is it. Um, costs is quite extraordinary how little work there is on costs. Um, I guess, again, this might reflect, to some extent, the fact that much of the early CEA was done on pharmaceuticals, where the costs are not entirely, but certainly to a large extent, um, the price of the pharmaceutical. Uh, but, of course, for services, for health services, costs are much, much more complex than that. Um, in principle, we should seek out these opportunity costs. If we use these resources for this patient, 
what is the cost for other patients. Uh, but in, in practice, that's not feasible, so we look at accounting costs. But um, their methods are applied uh, highly, um, uh, with great degrees of variation. Um, there's a lot of judgment involved. And in particular, in health services, where there are these extraordinarily high levels of overheads, might be 40 or 50 percent uh, of costs are in the form of some sort of overhead um, which can't be allocated to individual patients. Uh, there's a great deal of room for judgment. To start the, the discussions around the proposed changes in the methodology, what we did first was to look at the previous methodology used um, for defining the EHP, um, which uh, this was used in 2011 to define that package up until 2016. So the process used was uh, a two-step process whereby first the burden of disease was considered um, and interventions that would, uh, conditions that would be included and addressed in the package um, were chosen whether, uh, based on whether they had a burden of disease greater than 10,000 dallies per year. Um, and then within these conditions that were chosen, uh, there was a search for cost-effective interventions um, to address these conditions uh, using the, the WHO choice uh, three times GDP per capita as the cost-effectiveness threshold. So the key issues were the, uh, the concept of the cost-effectiveness threshold was misused, and that's what I'll talk about next. Um, the, uh, the order of assessing burden of disease first and cost effectiveness second, um, having a detrimental impact on population health and actually the objective of maximizing population health because there's cases where there's very cost effective interventions which address a very small burden of disease and you're automatically discounting these by assessing burden of disease first. Um, there was no explicit prioritization of interventions actually included within the package, um, which I think is also important, um, particularly if your package is the cost of delivering it is greater than the resources available. Um, and there was no reflection of the supply and demand side constraints on implementation, um, which again I'll come on to. So the results of uh, looking at the, the, the evidence available um, were stark. I mean, the, the estimates are that instead of three times GDP per capita, um, the cost effectiveness threshold should come somewhere between 1% and 51% of GDP per capita in Malawi. Um, so rather than uh, 1,050 US dollars per DALI averted, we took the, the uh, mean of the two papers and came up with the threshold of $61 per DALI averted. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this later and, and how, whether this was necessarily right or not. So getting into the actual methodology we used, um, which I think at this stage I, I do have to mention the, the work done by the University of York and, and uh, Paul Ravel and Jess Okalek specifically um, in helping um, come up with this. Um, they were really the, the, the main two people who, who uh, drove the, the process. Um, the idea was that we, we wouldn't look at burden of disease first, um, unlike the previous methodology. We would assess the cost effectiveness of interventions um, and rank them according to ISAs uh, first and foremost, so that you have the most cost effective interventions um, down to the least um, in an order. But you can't prioritize between interventions just by ISAs. Um, you do at some stage have to take account of the local disease burden um, that you're working under. And this was done by taking into account the population health effects, um, which was uh, calculated by looking at the case numbers um, that each intervention dealt with. We had a, a long, long list um, of 250 plus interventions um, ranked according to uh, the net dallies averted, which is the, the population health effect of the intervention. And um, 
basically the the idea is that you just work down the list taking just thinking about cost effectiveness you work down the list um, and would include all of the interventions until you reached a stage where um, the net dallies averted is zero um, and that would mean that basically that would be interventions um, that are cost effective and and dealing with the disease burden um, and that would form your package thinking just on a, uh, a purely cost effectiveness um, basis we did this at first and the issue we came across was that if we included all of these interventions uh, the cost um, purely looking at drug and commodity costs uh, was about 150 million US dollars over what our budget was so that brings us back to the point of a cost effectiveness threshold and where there's obviously still work needed um, to be done in uh, establishing context-specific thresholds. This assumes full implementation. So um, what the methodology also is able to do is take account of the health system constraints um, of implementation. And there's many, many um, uh, aspects of a health system which can impact on this shortage of health workers, shortage of infrastructure, uh, medical equipment, which essentially mean that even if a package is within your budget and financially attainable, you won't be able to deliver it to the entire population in need. So the framework um, is able to quantify the population health impact of intervention specific and system level constraints and the impact it has on the implementation level, um, which would then have an impact on the population health effect of any intervention. Really, it's about disaggregating the interventions um, as much as possible, but while still maintaining their clinical acceptability. Um, so I think there's a, a whole discussion around um, how you lay out the interventions there. Um, again, the, the, the previous framework being an issue and um, risking lowering population health, I think we, we've at least moved away from a lot of the problems that that caused um, with this methodology. Um, but it only works if it's actually stuck to during the process, um, which is where the issues lie. And then, as mentioned previously, the, um, the cost effectiveness threshold estimate that we had still not being perfect. Um, uh, it's still too high, um, but then the lower you get, the less people are willing to engage in conversation because the harder rationing, you know, it becomes an even harsher rationing environment and uh, upset a lot of people with um, when you have a package with only three or four interventions in. It's, uh, it's hard. The take home message is that basically uh, methodology is very important and uh, CEA can be used, but used inappropriately, it won't achieve the desired objective. Um, so the first thing to do is make sure your methodology is right. Um, but this doesn't guarantee success. Um, ensuring the methodology is right is a, a necessary but not sufficient condition for achieving your objectives. And the process is um, equally important and the two really cannot be separated. Um, but I think in Malawi, at least, we, we, we've made a start. We've made some improvements on, on the situation uh, as it was before, um, but there's still a lot of work to be done. and. Uh, We'll, we'll see in the future how that goes. I think uh, that's, that's it, basically. Thank uh, you. The work is done by under IDSI's uh, work uh, with the support from uh, also the Minister of Health of Vietnam. Actually, I give you a really short background that the health benefit package under the National so Social Health Insurance, or we call SHI, SHI programs, that they it choose since 2009. And you can see it's, it's a long list of medicine, medical device, and medical supplies are under this packet. It's 20,000 items. Uh, so it's almost everything. Uh, and for medicines, it's very unfortunate that it's, they include the name of medicines, but without saying about the indication for the use. So it's give a free choice or free check to uh, medical practitioners to prescribe medicine for any patients uh, and the, according to the, the health insurance laws that issued in 2008, that they are planning to, to revise and make them uh, to be the new, they call basic health service package. 
and that package will be issued by 2018. So during this process, they need to change from health benefit package to be the basic health service package. So, and this is the point that the Minister of Health of Vietnam requests the support from IDSI and, I ha and HITAP uh, to provide them a technical assistance uh, to design how they, how, how they introduce the new packages based on the ex existing one and what is the approach that should be done. So we realize it's, 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 it's a huge work because it's 20,000 items. It's not possible that we use approach that we listen from the Malawese. I mean, trying to do co-effectiveness and looking at budget impact for 20,000 items. So we, 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 we come up with different approach. So first is we select uh, the priority uh, the selection of priority issue is that we we develop together with the stakeholder in Vietnam to see how we start revising the very big packages and we come up with the criteria in the stakeholder consultation meeting chaired by the the vice health minister and the the the, uh, the director general of uh, VSS that they say should we look at the highest budget. Uh, impact first. So we look at the highest budget limbers from the Vietnam Social Security Scheme or VSS. And then we uh, we look at the, the database from VSS that uh, limbers to them in 2015. So we come up with the long list of medicines, <coughs> medical device, medical supply. And we look at top 20 of medicines. It's really interesting. Top 20 of medicines out of uh, 12,000 medicine lists we found that it consumed one third of the drugs budget in Vietnam. That is very huge. For five medical services, including PET CT, CT scan, MRI, it consumes 12% of medical supplies budget. So we, we think this is, this is something that is very interesting and we should, we should look at first. So we come up with this is the process. Again, the process is come from a stakeholder consultation meeting. We agree together that it's not possible to do one by one health technology assessment. So we 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 better to start with the indication because we realize the medicines there is no indication. So we we want to look at the current prescription whether they are rational enough. And uh, so we, we look at the, the guidelines and the literature. With the guidelines, we look at the virtual health organization guidelines, clinical practice guidelines. We look at the, uh, the international guidelines, if available, and Vietnamese guidelines. And we do the literature, we try to identify appropriate medical indications for those 13 medicines that we are include in these studies. And then we matching the indication that we identify from guidelines and from systematic review with the current prescriptions. So we will see match and mismatch of medicine prescribed to medical indication that recommended in the guidelines. And then because we are aware that there might be a lot of medicines, a lot of patients without that medical indication receiving medicines. So we also don't want to say that those who are not in line with the review of literature in step one will not be appropriate in Vietnam. So we allow st uh, stakeholders, again, this time is professionals, a so, uh, professional group, to have a say. So we, we let them review what not include in the recommended from the uh, recommended indication from the literature review. So we let them review again and to, to see whether there are some medical indication, even without mentioning in the uh, literature and the guidelines, but the uh, health professional in Vietnam still thinks this is appropriate. So we, we will see what happened because this never be done before. So it's the first time we apply this approach in Vietnam. Uh, so the approach that I'm going to show you today uh, is as an approach to use what we've got, using the skills that we've got, uh, and the available resources that we've got in the best way we possibly can. And I'm not proposing this is applicable to every single country. Uh, it works for New Zealand, and I think there's definitely some lessons that we can learn from New Zealand's approach. Um, but but, uh, but as, as far as uh, yeah, applicability, applicability, you can make your own, you can make your own judgment. So the mission, uh, the legislative mission, is to secure for eligible people uh, in need of pharmaceuticals the best health outcomes that can reasonably be achieved and from within the amount of funding provided. So here are the, here are the methods when we talk about the economic assessment. Um, here's what, uh, what um, Pharmac applies, and actually some York colleagues were involved um, very heavily in this as well. Um, so they call it the prescription for pharmacoeconomic um, analysis. 
Um, and the, the first, the top bit there is what they call the detailed analysis, and that looks very similar actually to the, to the nice, nice methodology um, and to the Drummond style um, sort of guidance that you'd see in any sort of good textbook. So it's, it's doing all the good things, so um, detailed and systematic identification of synthesis, um, looking at clinical effectiveness, um, health-related quality of life, using the quality, um, and critical appraisal of the evidence. Um, they look at other departments, so non-health departments in a qualitative manner, um, representing uncertainty, those probabilistic sensitive analysis, and then they do a formal appraisal, so um, by, the, by their um, pharmacology and therapeutics committee, and also we'll get external experts to, to, to come in and review. Called a detailed, typically taking about two to six months of a full-time um, equivalent. Now that's, that's the, the one that we're sort of used to and often people talk about in, in cost-effectiveness analysis. This is where Pharmac manages to be a bit more nimble because they need to make a decision. Often it's, it, they need to make rapid decisions. So they've got what's called an indicative, um, taking four to six weeks, which is toned down a bit, uh, prelim preliminary, so it's a rapid assess um, assessment using largely opportunistic data, um, still a critical appraisal, um, but just an internal review of other Pharmac staff, so not a formal um, appraisal step. Um, and then there's the rapid, one to two days. So that really is back of the envelope stuff. Um, and that would be, for instance, if they're reviewing, say, an exceptional circumstances you know, um, request for maybe a small handful of, of patients, there's immediate need for a decision, and they'll, they'll do this. Um, note this is very, they're fairly skilled people, and they've got a lot of data sets and everything else, so within 15 minutes you could do a data dump of, of medicine utilisation and everything else using the New Zealand, um, uh, using data that's already available, so they have the, the, this is just pure analytical um, time. But this, this approach gives them quite a lot of flexibility. Uh, and it means that they can meet that, if we remember that the accountability for, frame, uh, for a reasonable framework, one of the key elements there was, was timeliness. So it means Pharmac can, can react very, very quickly to the, to the needs and be policy relevant. I want to touch on one more thing. It's been very, very relevant to, to actually what Yacht was just talking about in, in Vietnam, but also to, to lots of different health systems. And this is called this, this concept of a special authority. That, that apply to proprietary medicines, and it really utilised the, the pharmaceutical schedule, the power of implementation to actually achieve implementation of, 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 uh, of the actual decisions that we're trying to make. So a special authority is, is a restriction uh, on the prescribing, so it gets integrated into the prescriber software, um, and say for a high cost, um, a high cost med, you could specify what um, clinical characteristics or the pathway of care that the patient had to un undergo. So you could say, for example, for a monoclonal antibody for arthritis, you'd say, has the patient tried the existing DMARDs? And the doctor would tick, and, and that, would, that would generate a, a number that would get applied to the prescription, and that means you could get your prescription reimbursed. But it meant you could have control over the indication for which the pharmaceutical was being used. Now, since 2001, it's really only been applied to about 4%, um, 3 4% of, of drugs. So we're talking about you know, the very high cost uh, monoclonal antibodies or to anything manufactured by Roche. Um, would be down here, but what has been, what has increased though, is the proportion of the drug cost that special authorities have been uh, attached to. So you've got over over half of the spending now is controlled with these special authorities, um, and the introduction of the electronic special authority system, which which came in in about 2008, really made that really that made that possible. And it's just as easy for a doctor to prescribe using a special authority as if there as if there isn't one there. So it's, um, it's one of the, the key things that Pharmac has really done that explains that 3.2% growth over time. So this is the, the, the last slide, but I just wanted to, um, Pharmac calls it its unique situation. Um, and so it's got the budget, and Tony, close your eyes. So there's no cost effectiveness threshold, if you noticed, from, the, from that table. There's relative assessment. So the ISA, yes, is calculated, is there, but there's not, and the marginal productivity of the health system exists, obviously. Uh, but there's no threshold that's hard and fast that will exist over, over time um, to say this is what we're going to use as our decision criterion to determine if this thing is cost effective or not. Um, and that interacts with negotiation um, and allows program budgeting and marginal anal analysis. Now, Pharmac was doing a lot of this stuff before people came up with this term, and then they said, actually, what we're doing, that actually fits, fits what these people are calling program budgeting marginal analysis, so I guess, yes, it is. Um, but this really... This really brings home um, the, the situation that Pharmac finds itself in uh, and how it can utilise um, cost effectiveness analysis and all the, the, the good processes, uh, but also in the light of their constrained budgets um, and the flexibility for negotiations. And before we jump into this, I just want to dispel a few myths. There's some ugly rumours about what ethics means and it's often a dirty word in some of these circles. 
Um, and I just want to start off by saying, okay, these are not true. Um, so some people say, well, ethics is an afterthought. We can come back and, and think about the ethics later or correct based on ethics. Um, ethics is the enemy of cost effectiveness. They're completely incompatible. That's just categorically untrue. Um, if you look at almost any public health ethics framework, it includes commitment to health maximization and utility. Um, ethics is not evidence-based. It's all this subjective willy-nilly stuff. So my ethics training was at a school of public health. Um, I can tell you affirmatively, at least in the way that I think about public health ethics, you cannot do good ethics analysis if you don't have good facts. Um, and that ethics is not useful or it's just not that important or where does it get us. Um, and I hope that throughout this presentation I can demonstrate that all of these are in fact myths. Um, and what we've been talking about this whole time is we're trying to figure out how we can pursue better decisions, better health, and do what's right so that we're making these good decisions, so that we are improving health, and that we're fulfilling duties, both role-specific duties as public health practitioners, as policymakers, as those who are assisting those making decisions, to other humans, and, and more broadly, what we owe to one another by virtue of being humans. So again, it's not just what's in or what's out, but why. And this is not an afterthought, as I mentioned earlier. This has to start from the very beginning in terms of the goals that you're setting for the plan and why you're setting them and having a good understanding of social values when you're setting that goals, of the burden of disease, of the kinds of outcomes that you want to impact and why those are the ones that you're picking, how the criteria that you select will cohere with that in order to operationalize them, um, which topics you're selecting, because there's already this kind of rationing that happens when you're figuring out, you know, what do we look at, what do we not look at? Um, and what's a justification for saying, maybe we need to take a closer look at this intervention? And that also depends on what kinds of ethics commitments that you're um, embodying in your plan. It also depends on what kind of evidence you're collecting. Um, both from the very start, you can't address inequities if you don't know that they exist. And if you're not collecting disaggregated data, but you can't track progress on them later if you don't know where you're starting at this baseline. And you can't evaluate an intervention across multiple dimensions if you don't know what to look for and what evidence to bring to bear. So this is, again, a very holistic approach for thinking about the entire policy cycle of the HPP. Um, and it goes from this very broad setting to you know, looking at a very specific intervention saying, do we include this? Do we not include this? Do we not include it yet? Do we include it for some but not for others? And all of that will depend on ethics throughout this entire cycle and just being really clear about what it is you're trying to achieve and why. So again, I mentioned some of the pitfalls if you're overlooking ethics in the health uh, priority setting process. So there's these unintentional and avoidable harms. Nobody wants that. Um, this potential to reinforce and worsen systematic disadvantage I think is a really important one. So a lot of people look at UHC as a way to try and address equity or inequities rather, um, or promote equity. But the one thing that we have to remember too is that this is gonna be a massive policy instrument that's gonna be systematically introduced and if we have biases or inequities that are built into the way that we're doing this, it has a huge potential to create new inequities or to reinforce the existing ones. So it's really important to think about that up front. This third one on inefficient allocation. So look, health is a moral good um, if we're not doing this right, if we're just sort of wasting money and not spending on things that are high value for money or good value for money and we can't justify why we're spending inefficiently, then that's just leaving all of these health benefits on the table that we could be getting if we were spending money better. And then this last one about the loss of public trust. So at least in the public health ethics frameworks that I am most acquainted with, keeping public trust is really important. It's a sign of respect, but it's also instrumentally really important if you actually want to achieve any of the goals that you're setting out. And I think that's become increasingly clear as we've been having these conversations about the importance of stakeholder engagement in terms of not, you know, over promising something you can't deliver and eroding trust and then losing all of the political will to move forward and all of the political capital you have to do things. But here's a way to think about what does ethics analysis and explicit ethics analysis look like in priority setting. So there's a lot of frameworks that are actually out there. Some of them are developed by philosophers, some of them by practitioners, um, some of them start very broad, some of them are looking very specifically at ethics and HTA. But most of them look something along the lines of, you have your foundational principles, so this is what we care about, we're committed to health maximizing, to avoiding harms, justice, fairness, respect, autonomy. 
solidarity in some cases, um, and we've seen that with some of the examples of the criteria that have been shared by different countries. And then there's different guidelines and considerations or questions for, you know, what in our particular context does that mean? Um, how do we think about this? And then usually there's some sort of, okay, but we also need to think about fair process, um, so it's got to be transparent and participatory. Depending on what you decide at the front are your specific equity objectives, it's going to inform all of those criteria downstream and how you actually see whether or not you're fulfilling your goals. So the second um, set of ethics considerations is around efficiency. So this is, again, not just about economics, but this is an ethics concern, um, that we have to be using our resources efficiently. We want to achieve greater gains in population health. That's the whole reason that we're here, that we're undertaking this endeavor. Um, we know that there's going to be these morally relevant opportunity costs if we're not using um, our limited resources wisely. And we also know that it threatens to, um, to sort of erode the longer term goals of the, um, of the project if we can't actually sustain it. Um, and we'll also derail potential future efforts if we want to try this again in the future if people don't trust the system or the government to do this. Well, cost effectiveness analysis can get us really far in a lot of these tough decisions and give us really important information for how to do this. And some people would even say it captures different types of equity and ethics considerations because it is in part built into the methods. It, in it includes these sort of values in terms of the methods that are adopted. It can't do everything. Um, you know, we can't rely only on CEA. It's a really important tool in the toolbox, but it's not the whole picture. You can see there's a whole ethics framework to considering um, all these other different categories um, in designing a health benefits package. When we talk about stakeholder engagement, it's one way um, of trying to get to grips with some of this information. Um, and stakeholder engagement can help us to understand social values. It can help us to understand what's really important uh, to people. And what do we mean by stakeholders? There are, of course, many different stakeholders. So the public is one stakeholder, but even within the public, there are different publics. So it's a difficult concept because when you want to engage the public, you want it to be represent, you want your group to be representative of the broader public, and that's not always possible. So sometimes you're going to have to have engagements with smaller groups of people, and, and it might be quite useful to start engaging with the most vulnerable groups of populations if you want to get to grips with these issues which Carly has spoken about. There are, of course, also patients, so not, well, there's a debate of all, is the public also a patient? Because at some stage in your life, you are actually a patient. But, but there are patient groups um, who are experiencing different, who have different disease profiles, and very important to engage with, with them as well. What we see is that sometimes we are hearing the voice of people, of the public, of patients who who shout the loudest. So people who are part of advocacy groups that have a lot of support, a lot of funding, a lot of backing, and they're, um, it's a lot easier for them to be engaging um, at higher levels with policymakers and with others. So when we talk about um, stakeholder engagement, it's also important to take that into account and make sure that we're engaging with those who don't always have the voice. And often those become the most important people to be engaging with. So public, patient, um, clinicians are often a group that we need to be engaging with as well. Um, and actually, um, NGOs and advocacy groups might also be very important to be engaging with. My public engagement work um, and the tool I've chosen to modify in South Africa and to pilot in, in Bushbuck Regia, which is in Mapumalanga province, the reason I've chosen this tool specifically is because it's twofold. It has two aims. The one is to engage the public just because it, it is something we should be doing and for all the reasons that Carly said. But something else that Carly touched on is that it also has a capaci uh, the potential to develop the capacity of the public to understand the need for trade-offs and rationing. So within this whole rhetoric around universal he health coverage, the public have come to assume that everything will be provided for everybody. And we know that isn't the case. Um, and we know that they will resist certain policies if not um, incorporated into this process. But the right type of engagement will also develop their capacity to understand rationing, to understand trade-offs, and to better uh, 
buy into this type of process. And what we've uh, realized, I think we, we are going to um, relook at, I think, first of all, the overall goals uh, of what we actually want to achieve. Uh, we have a number of processes that we need to uh, reconcile. Currently, we're just completing the National Health Strategic Plan, which should have some aspects of what we'd like to deliver in the next five years, and that has to be costed. And so um, we need to ensure that um, uh, the goals, overall goals are aligned to what we hope to achieve in the National Strategic Plan. I think uh, that will also provide a, 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 a very solid case for investment and spend and resource allocation. Um, because um, uh, I'll tell you, we, we, because initially we were thinking um, we needed a separate, obviously, package for the health insurance scheme, which we are looking at. Then there was a discussion about creating a, an essential health package for the entire system. Then we also have a resource allocation formula that we are revisiting. And then we have a national health strategic plan, which we are completing. So I think first things first, uh, we take a step back and ensure the national strategic plan, I think, will be the basis. And then uh, what we'd also like to do is uh, create a process to embed uh, changes as they occur to the package uh, before we embark on something as detailed as a uh, maybe a very detailed um, benefit package for SHI. So one of the things we'll do uh, we, is that we'll leverage on some of the existing structures f and the governance structures that we have developed in Zambia. So we have very robust swap mechanisms. And uh, one of the technical working groups we have is called the Healthcare Financing Technical Working Group. And, one, and this uh, contains um, or is composed of members that span academia, um, the donor community, and many of the stakeholders um, that have been mentioned in, in, in the governance. So we really like that governance piece. And so we want to leverage that, uh, come up with clear guidelines for HTA processes uh, within that so that uh, when a new uh, interventions or uh, uh, processes are coming through, we would like to subject them to a very uh, well thought out process to begin with. And so that for future reference, there's a, there's a well known uh, process that can be used to reevaluate changes. The, the third aspect is that I think one of the things we want to look at is uh, leverage this experience to uh, expand capacity. Uh, I think we've spoken with Karen and some other members here and that we can start in a small way with certain projects to try and uh, provide a case, our own case study, to try so that we can uh, um, use it as an advocacy tool for change of, for policy, basically. So I think also building capacity within um, the country will be important. Um, and uh, we hope this won't be the last. We, we see you, but, uh, and so um, the capacity issues we, we think w w is something we need to really think about uh, carefully. So yes, I think this has been very useful for us. Um, and I think hope to avoid uh, some, of, some, uh, some huge <laughs> missteps that potentially we could have taken. So it's been very useful for us, uh, very useful learning uh, uh, process. Thank you. So back in ground in Tanzania that he only 7% of the, uh, the population are covered by national health insurance. This is a formal insurance. 19% is by the community health fund, 1% private health insurance, and 80% of the population, they are living in the rural, and they get the primary health care services. But we expect that by 2019, we will have the universal health coverage. But currently, there are also services which are exempted, they are free, including immunization, treatment of HIV, AIDS, and lepros. Uh, as far as the exercise is concerned, I'll talk on the benefit health, health package in regard to the National Essential Medicine List. 
And the goal of developing this national essential medicine list is to use evidence in regard to safety, efficacy, quality, and the cost effectiveness. Uh, and the process, we are using the health technology assessment with support from Priceless South Africa. And who are the key stakeholders in this process? We include the health, prof uh, health professionals. We have uh, different chapters, and in each chapter, we have a lead reviewer who is a technical person at that area. But we have included the economist and also the professional association. And I can say that uh, this process is transparent. And uh, after finishing the document, we expect that we'll share it in the ministry website so that uh, we get more input from other stakeholders. After we expect that uh, the document will be finalized by May 2017. And after that, the roadmap is that uh, we will share the document with National Health Insurance that, uh, so that they incorporate it in their uh, health package because nation, our national health insurance, sometimes they include medicine which are outside the essential medicine list. So this will ensure that they include, they take all the medicines which have been reviewed. As he finally said the first day, their list it has around 20,000. Ours it has around 500, but we expect that because we are using now evidence-based, the list will be few than what we have now. But we expect this time we'll do monitoring because sometimes we have the list, but initially they sometimes prescribe outside the essential medicine list. But what we really need is also capacity building in health technology assessment and methods for cost effective analysis. Right now we are using health technology assessment, but it's mostly in. Uh, evidence, but we haven't gone much on the cost-effective analysis. And you also will share best practice from other countries like Malawi, Zambia. Yeah. Thank you very much. Ghana, the current situation we have in Ghana. Um, Ghana currently has a very generous health benefits package um, that caters for tertiary, secondary, and primary health care and it has been running for about 10 years. But there are problems with it because uh, we have, they have outstanding areas in reimbursement for an average of about 11 months. <laughs> so is it sustainable, is it not? That was looked at and in 2016, the package was reviewed and the focus was now on primary health care. Then at the end of 2016, we had general elections. The government was changed. So will the new government accept the review? Will it not accept the reviewed um, package? We are not sure yet. But um, we'll see what happens. That's a work in progress. Um, there's change in leadership at the sector ministry, health, change in leadership at NHIA. So. But also we have an HTA working group. So um, we hope to, with a goal refocused on primary health care, hopefully being accepted. Um, we hope to use the low hanging fruits of the standard treatment guidelines and EML as the selecting process for HTA and um, there was a pilot on, we did a model, pilot model on hypertension. It was presented then at the ministry, it was accepted. So um, there's a, there are a lot of uncertainties, but working on that, uh, we, the HTA group intends, we need to build capacity on the current HTA working group to include budget officers and account officers and all that. Um, taking baby steps to strengthen the group, um, build capacity in negotiation skills. Um, 
moving forward, we plan to adopt best practices around the world. It's been very inspiring and a, a huge um, eye-opener learning from the various countries and what has been going on. Um, fortunately, the medicines policy makes provision for HTA, so that is not a major problem. So. And it looks like the main thing that we could do better and to enhance the work that has been done so far is more time on country examples and case studies. And the Malawi case that was presented by Finn and Jerry was definitely cited as one of the most uh, useful things that, that uh, was presented. Uh, everyone loves more on methods, which is interesting. Where's Peter? More on politics and stakeholder mapping, and maybe we can come back to that in the session after this. Um, a wish that the budget section had been more technical, and I, I definitely. Um, more discussion on how the pharmaceutical piece fits in with the services piece in packages in a practical way. Um, whether that's guidelines or something else. At the end of the day, we were talking amongst ourselves and we said to ourselves, well, maybe if you're starting really from an input-based budget, it, you know, start with the pharmaceutical list. It's, it's, it's the first thing and the indications, the stuff that Yacht was talking about. And then finally, something about managing population expectations for the benefits plan. Such a huge issue. So little to say yet. But um, acknowledged, a very important issue. So the question is, what are your next steps regarding design or adjustment of the benefits plan in the near term or medium term? So is it a question of clarifying the goals and their relative priority that would in turn determine the criteria and the methods and all the rest of that? Uh, set? Is it the triage part? Is it, is it deciding where additional analysis is needed? Um, is it more about process? Uh, it, you know, have you consulted all the stakeholders that you think are relevant for making the policy effective? Um, is it to develop a threshold or a budget-based decision rule? Um, what, well, actually, a big take home for me, I've, I've sort of always had this in the back of my mind, but I'm, I'm wondering if that budget-based rule is more practical in some ways uh, than a threshold that is so abstract and that people can't necessarily get their heads around. But I'm sure Peter will have thoughts on that. Um, is it to set up an independent HTA body to inform decision-making, as in Indonesia and South Africa? Is it something totally different? So if you can think a little bit about what is the main task that awaits you in terms of the further development effectiveness of this policy? Mm -hmm.